been in church, but even those out in the web land joining us. <laughs> Thank you for joining with us. I hope you're, everyone is well. And <clears throat> I'd like to just share something with you, maybe, maybe a little word of encouragement. Uh, one morning this week, I woke up with a, you ever wake up with a verse, just with a verse? First thing, which I, I like when that happens. And uh, the verse that I was on my mind was uh, about being bold, coming boldly. And it, I just couldn't get it off my mind all week long. <clears throat> so I want to uh, share with you what the scripture says about boldness and being bold. Uh, the word bold or boldly or boldness is found 32 times in the whole Bible. Once or twice in the Old Testament only. And so I want to just look at some of the places that it's found and maybe use an application to apply it to our walk with the Lord and what we, uh, how I think we need this. It, it, going along with what Brother Chris preached this morning, uh, to be able to uh, share with the people, we're going to have to have boldness in the days ahead. We're going to have to have a boldness that comes outside of ourselves. Does that make sense? We can't muster this up. If you've ever tried that, you know it doesn't do any good. I've done that. You, you, you've just forced yourself to, because of condemnation, well, I'm going to witness to that person and it just falls all over itself sometimes. And so I think let's look at the scripture to see what, what it says about boldness and uh, the results of it and, and maybe what we've got to do possibly to, to get it. Uh, let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you, dear Heavenly Father, to bless your word. Bring, Lord, this word to our understanding, we ask. We have nothing to bring. Lord, we don't have any knowledge of our own. We know that knowledge puffs up. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom to see what you're trying to say to us in these days. What, what, Lord, we need boldness. We, we're, there, there's, there's so much fear and timidness, and, and even our own heart seems to fail us at times. Lord, we, we, uh, we ask you to give us the strength and the grace to receive your word. Lord, open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. And Lord, help us to give you the praise for it. We, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Hebrew meaning of boldness is, is, is strength or force or security, might, power, it comes from a, from a root word that means to be stout or, or hardened or impotent, per, per, to prevail. <clears throat> In the Greek, <clears throat> it means an all outspokenness. In, in fact, one of the scriptures we're going to read is when we come boldly to the throne of grace. You know, that, that particular usage there m means that uh, we come with an all-out spokenness. We're speaking, we're, we're, we're telling all, one preacher said. You come to the throne telling all. It means a frankness, a bluntness. You, you know, when you come to the Lord, you don't have to make up these pretty words. You just be, be yourself. You, you, just, you just be yourself. You just be honest. Be honest with him. You know, my Aunt Geisha was blind, and she would pull a chair up, literally, and say, Jesus, sit in this chair. And she would talk to him. Just talk to him. And uh, I was named after her son. He had, was killed in a motorcycle uh, accident. It was my father's best friend. And she was a godly woman. I remember, I have great memories. Her. My Uncle Ford was a World War I veteran. And I have, I remember sitting and just reading the scripture to them, reading books to them. And she would just talk to the Lord, just out loud. Uh, 
just with a, and it means a frankness. Uh, uh, it means confidence. There's also a, a, a version of, of this word boldness that means it gives the idea of an extreme conduct. We see that in when the Holy Ghost came on the, the disciples in the day of Pentecost. It was an extreme response, was it not? They were hiding in this upper room, and when the Holy Ghost came on them, there was a boldness that was at, sent them out into the street and gave them the ability to speak with uh, languages that weren't in their vocabulary, you see. So the, the Holy Spirit gave them that, and it was, a, it was, a, uh, it was an extreme conduct. And also the last one is telos, which means to set out for a definite point or goal. So uh, when the Lord gives us boldness, we have a definite focus. Does that make sense? We know what we're here for. We know our purpose. We know what he's called us to be. When that gi he gives us a boldness to, to know our purpose in the earth. And that's what we, we, we... All right, let me just mention then... If you would go with me to Ephesians chapter 3, first point. Ephesians chapter 3, uh, first point, I can boldly ask him to manifest through my life his manifold wisdom. I have that God-given right, if you would want to say it that way. I'm going to start reading in verse 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God is given to me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am uh, less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now this hit me so hard. Verse, verse 10. I'd never seen this. <clears throat> to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now get, he's saying I've got to manifest something to the heavenly powers, the principalities and powers in heavenly places. And he said I'm going to do it through the church. That's basically what the translation of this verse means might be known by the church or through the church, in other words. The man, so here's what, we, here's what part of it is. You and I, the church of the living God, are to be a manifestation of the manifold works of God. That's what we're here. That's, what, that's one of the functions, the purposes of us, that God, and, and, and he says to the, an example, a, a, a principality in power, uh, when Job, when, when it said that the, they, the, sen, was it the sons of men come to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan was among them, and he says to Satan, where have you been? I've been to and fro in the earth. And he said, have you considered my servant Job? And could we say how he's a manifestation of a man that eschews evil? You see? And he was manifesting the, the workings of God to the principalities in heavenly places. It's incredible. I, I'd never seen that before. I thought, Lord, are we that? Are we that? Are you that? Am I that? Am I a manifestation of the manifold workings of God to principalities and, and even just people? So I can boldly ask him to, Lord, it's not wrong for me to pray and say, Lord, give me this grace to, mani to make manifest your wisdom to society, to, 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 to everywhere that I go. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, if you kind of hold your place there and just back up, one of the one or two places that this boldness is found in, in the Old Testament. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Look at verse 1. Who is as the wise man? And who knoweth the interpretation of the thing, of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. You see that? So it's telling us that wisdom literally changes the countenance of a man or a woman. Now, you, you know, when a person has the ability, now wisdom, wisdom gives you the confidence to speak boldly, does it not? When you're speaking on a subject, that you know a lot about. Now, I, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. You can have knowledge about a certain thing and you can still be so proud and puffed up. God can't use that. He cannot. Well, because the scripture tells us that knowledge puffs up, but charity edifies. So wisdom is the ability to convey knowledge in a godly manner, in a way that brings glory to God. So if you and I can speak, our countenance will reflect that that is in, in us, the ability to convey the wisdom that God has put in us. You, 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 I love to, when, you know, just to give you an example, Ravi Zacharias, when he would stand before people and speak, the wisdom of that man was just so, so far so amazing and he could just speak his his countenance would reveal that which was just in him able to reveal it now you take a man you you you, you give me a topic that i absolutely know nothing about you can look at my face and tell i i ain't got a clue i mean i don't have to say anything it, my face just reveals it you see but but when we have the ability that God gives us to, to manifest his powers to, to the intent that principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, by the church or through the church, you see. So one thing the church can do, we can ask him for this boldness to, man, to make manifest this wisdom. Now, a second point, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, I just want to mention something to the deacons. I'm not picking on them. Deacons. Why, why is it when you read something over and over, then you just never see it? Uh, 1 Timothy 3.13. Look, notice what it says. For they that have used the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith. You see that? How does that happen? You see? That's right. Brother Chris said, a servant's heart. When you make yourself available in the office of a deacon, let me read this to you out of, uh, I believe it's the Amplified. Those who have served well as deacons gain a high standing, having a good reputation among the congregation and great confidence or boldness in the faith which is founded on and centered in Christ Jesus. You see? So even in the office of a deacon, this is an admonition that there's great boldness in that office. Just look at the examples we have. Stephen, who confounded those men in the courts, just confounded them. And you remember his countenance? It was that of like an angel. And he, they gnashed on him with their teeth because his, the wisdom that God gave him, that manifested boldness that through the church, through this man speaking, they could do nothing but gnash on him and ultimately take his life. 
Uh, T- Timothy, now, we, we, we realize that Timothy was, was a man who Scripture tells us was timid, but Paul encouraged him to have boldness. The Lord has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of, of a sound mind. So the deacons are given this promise. I consider this a promise, don't you? You purchase to yourself, so to speak, or one of the uh, translations is you, you've obtained it. You've attained it, ob- obtained it now, use it, right? Use the boldness that God has given you in this great office. Again, I'm, I'm trying to admonish, not be criticized. I need this as much as anybody in here. Uh, number th- point three. I can come in my weakness and in my need. Hebrews chapter four. Hebrews 4. Uh, I'm going to start away, maybe a little far up, uh, at verse 12. I just would like to start at verse 12 of Hebrews 4. For the word of God is quick, or it means it's alive, it's living and active. And it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Now, I don't have to tell you that uh, God's word divides our, it separates the, the, the holy and the profane in our own hearts. Whether you like to admit it or not, there's things in our hearts that ought not be there. And the word of God is a sword that divides that, you see. Because it goes on to say in verse 13, Neither is there any creature that's not and manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are. Now that word infirmities, listen to what it means. It is a feebleness of mind or body, both. It is a moral, it's a, it can be a moral thing. It's a frailty. It could be, it could be frailty in, it, it could just be a weakness either in body or the a weakness to follow the a frailty in your moral conduct, you see. It could be an area in your life that you struggle with. You, you fail in this certain area. That's exactly what it is. It's a weakness. It, it's, 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 it, is a, it comes from a root word that means strengthless, figuratively and morally. In other words, I, have, I don't have the moral strength to resist these certain things possibly. Example. I, I can't do it. I can't. I, I you know, I've, I've literally prayed to the Lord, and I'd say, God, I can't, I can't do this. I cannot fight this. I can't win. I, I can't defeat it. Every, it defeats me again and again. And this is the person who's aware of their infirmities, they're aware of their weaknesses, they're aware of their strengthlessness, This is the person who verse 16 applies to. Let us therefore, all right, considering, therefore, considering your frailties, considering your weaknesses, your inability to have strength in a certain area. That's the one who should come boldly. In this particular word, telling all. Unto the throne of grace. To obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That word, <laughs> I'd never heard this word before. It means to come near. It's, the word is lumbano. Lumbano. It means to, to come near and up, to obtain or take something. It, it, it's a... Uh, it means to get a hold of. 
One tense of the verb means to just seize it, almost come violently. In other words, I'm coming with a purpose into the presence of the Lord. I need him. Desperately, maybe you could say. Have you ever been desperate for him? Desperate for him? I'm going to tell you what makes you desperate is weakness. Any weakness will put your dependency upon the Lord. It's not a, nothing to be ashamed of to find yourself in a place of weakness. Apostle Paul struggled with that. He was a man who had a very strong will. And when this thorn that was given to him, this messenger of Satan to buffet him, you know, three times, he says, Lord, remove this thing. Remove this thing from me. And the Lord says, no. My grace is sufficient for you. You're, you're going to have to depend on me completely in this area, whatever that area was. Paul, you're going to have to be content to draw strength from me in this spot. That's the only way. So Paul said, okay, then I just gladly, I glory in my infirmities. Because then I'm weak. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Because that strength comes from outside of me. It comes from a source, uh, it comes from a source outside of ourselves, the ability. So we find, uh, we find mercy and we find grace. And we said this before, mercy is given to those, uh, but grace is even super abundantly added the strength. God, does, God gives the forgiveness, but then he gives the strength to go on. He, he, it's an incredible grace is an incredible thing. All right. Next. I can draw near in Hebrews 10. This is over a couple pages. I'm, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot more. I'm about done. Hebrews 10. Starting at, I'd like to start at verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. You can find this in Jeremiah. You can find it in Ezekiel. When talking of, the, of, of God's people, when they were so far gone, they had profaned his name among the heathen. And the Lord says, for my name's sake, I'm going to, I, literally, by my grace, I'm going to go in and I'm going to put my law in their hearts. And, and it was speaking of the, oh, the day that we live today. You and I live in this time that we're reading right here. Where God literally puts his law in our hearts, in our, our minds, he writes them. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. You see that, that word? Therefore, because our sins and our iniquities, he's remembered no more. To enter into the holiest. Now, here's my question. What keeps you from entering? Do you want to go there? And why do you? This scripture says that we have an opportunity to enter into the holiest of holies. Now, not everybody wants to go there. This is the truth. And I ask myself the question, do I want to? And if so, why? If not, why? Are you content to stand afar off? That's what the children of Israel did. They told Moses, you... You talk to God. We'll listen to you. We're all right back here at our tent door. We'll watch the glory come down. And we'll see that manifestation of the Lord's presence overshadow that tabernacle and you listen to him. But we're all right right here. I fear sometimes. I, I ask the Lord today, Lord, is that me? Is it, am, am I that person who does not want to go in to the holiest of holies. I mean, that was not even allowed. I, I, I can imagine if you were in the priesthood, would you want that job? 
I'm thinking, go ahead. I don't know. You, you, you think uh, you, you're going to die if, you, if something ain't right. You better be right. You go in there and you're thinking, I'm all right to light the candles over here or whatever. And I thought, how many? But you take somebody like Joshua. He never departed. What drew him there? And Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. In other words, I don't, I, I'm, I don't need another commandment. I want you. I don't need something else to write. Maybe I'm just adding that in, not what he said, but there's more. In other words, Lord, I, I want to see. And to the point where the Lord says, okay, you can't see me, but, but I'll hold my hand over you. And, and you see my back parts. It, it, it had such a draw. And I thought, Lord, if we have this opportunity to go into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. In other words, you can't say, well, you know, I've had a bad day. No. It just said right here, therefore, your sins are blotted out. You, you have no, that's not a reason. I'm just not good enough. No, it's not a reason. There must be something else. And I ask myself a question. Do I want to? Why would I? Why would I want to go there? Just the bottom line. Just to be with him. It's the truth. Does my desire for him? Now, let's, let's look at this. Back up to Hebrews 9. Just back up a page, maybe. And look what it says. In the Hebrews 9, looking at, I'm going to start at verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So we know when he entered into that holy place, we do know the veil was rent from top to bottom. Access, full access was given to the presence of the Lord. For if the bulls of, of blood of bulls and of goats and ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Now get these next words. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. That word serve means to minister. Is it possibly possible and that my conscience needs to be purged? And before I'm able to minister, before I even have a desire to minister to him. Is it possible, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying, is it possible there's something in my conscience that would stop me from wanting to enter into the holiest of holies? What excuse would I have? Well, there is none. There is none. And I thought today, Lord, you, how much it must grieve you that so many other things get our attention than him or his presence. I'm not trying to bring guilt or condemnation. I'm just saying, is it possible that we spend so much time on so many things and he gets a small percentage of my attention? I don't have time. And we, we've seen this when the Lord made a big supper and he sent, sent out people. Well, I've got a piece of land. I've got to tend to it. I've got to mule or something. I've got a, you know, there was, there was always something. And so the Lord said, just go out into the highways and the byways and call them, come in to, t to taste of my supper. And, and I think of the old song, Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people, come and dine. And I think what is spread in the holiest of holies and made available to us day by day and we turn in busyness and walk away.
from that. Now, to minister, to minister, is it, do you, can, can you minister to the living God? I, I think so. You say, what can I give God? He just wants you. He's not asking for performance. He's already performed everything. He's just asking for you and I. My grandkids don't have to do a thing. They just come, come over. That's all I need. I just need them. I don't need them to perform for me. In fact, the truth of the matter is I want to perform for them as much as I can. My job in this life is to, to provide as much as I can for them. It's not the other way around. I want to do for them. You see, how much more is God willing to do that for us? If we can't come boldly in time of weakness, pouring our heart out in, in finding mercy, it tells me that maybe the prodigal son who, who, who came into the presence of his father thinking, if I could just get a spot back here again, I'm not worthy. And the father lavishes on him the love of a son who's never strayed. And you see, I, I, I think sometimes we, we, we avoid the, the, the holiest of holies. We avoid it because we think I'm not worthy. I, I've, I've done this. I've done that. I've, got, I've had a terrible day. I've lost my temper. And we, we just say, well, I'll stay back here and I'll just be content. I'll, I'll listen to the preached word and I'll study my word, but I, I won't, I, I, can't, I can't draw near today. I just can't do it, you see. Our results in Acts chapter four, Acts chapter four, <clears throat> And there are, are there, are, are there results of this? <clears throat> now, look at verse 13 with me. Now, these are results of somebody. Now, look what it says. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. So here's a result of spending time with him, right? It, 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 it allows, the, the, it gives us the boldness we need to face a wicked society. Just the same chapter going down to verse 31. Look at this, it says, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. See there? These are two results of, time, of just being with God. The presence of God. Finally, we're given the one last, my last point is have you ever thought of this in 1 John chapter 4? It says that we're to have boldness in the day of judgment. Did you know that? I never thought of that before. Look at what it says, 1 John. 1 John chapter 4. Verse, I'll start at verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect or complete, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. That jumped off the page to me. So there is literally, there is a preparation for judgment. 
an ability. So obviously some people in the day of judgment will not have boldness, right? But if we remain in his love, there it goes back to the presence of the Lord again. If we, that because as he is, so are we in the world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. He, that fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect or complete in love. We love him because he first loved us. So boldness, we, we, by, by entering in, and entering into the holiest of holies and entering into the presence of the Lord, we're literally given boldness. Now, that boldness is not a confidence in the flesh at all. It's just, it's just, I love him. He loves me and I know it, right? It's just that knowledge that God loves me. He's not against me. Have you ever thought of that? He's not against you. Have you ever felt like he was? I have, many times. Sure, he must be against me. I must have, God resists the proud. He must be resisting me somehow. He gives grace to the humble. God is, I'm going to end with this verse. If God be for us, who can be against us? Right? He that spared not his own son. Anyone have a word? Boldness. We need bold. I pray God give us boldness in all these areas of our life. And, and maybe tonight, before you go to bed, you can enter in the holiest of holies for a time. He doesn't give us a time. Don't set the clock. That's just legalism. You start telling people how many minutes you spent. What is that? No. It's quality time. It's not the length of it. It could be, and you know, you can, you can enter the holiest of holies in the car, going down the road. Just shut things off and just turn the radio off and say, Lord, let me speak to you. You've got housework to do. Do it while you're doing your, he knows that. He knows you've got a schedule. To f he knows that. He understands that. Those just don't shut him out of it. Just don't shut him out of your everyday stuff that you do. Make him a part of it. You see, you can enter into that place all, on and off. All. Brother Lawrence did that. You read his book. He washed dishes. And he would practice. He's called practicing his presence. He practiced the presence of the Lord in everything he did. Everything. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you, Lord, to help us to make this real to us. We we ask you, Lord, please make this real that we would enter in. Lord, forgive us for neglecting you day in and day out. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us. Please have mercy on us and help us to enter in that, that place, that holy place, that we would come boldly in telling all and pouring our, our heart before you. Lord, you love us and help us to keep ourselves and dwell into that love that you've given us. Help make it real, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.